Welcome to the I Speak Fundy Biosphere series. We want to become more fluent when speaking about the Fundy Biosphere. In this series, we'll be covering everything from the sciences of ecology and forestry to climate action and even hiking, exploring, and tourism. Join us as together we learn how truly special the Fundy Biosphere is. Welcome to the Fundy Biosphere I Speak series. I am Ben Cummings, and today I have with me Adam Cheeseman of Nature NB. Adam, how are you doing? Great, Ben. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. So talk to me a little bit about what uh, Nature NB is for those who may not be as familiar. Yeah, so Nature and Bees, uh, we are a non-for-profit uh, charitable organization. Uh, we work to celebrate, conserve, and protect uh, New Brunswick's natural heritage. Uh, we do that through education, networking, and collaboration. So we have a number of different, um, you know, citizen science and education and species at risk programming. Um, and we do um, kind of a little bit of everything and just to kind of advance, um, you know, a lot of awareness and, and knowledge about New Brunswick's natural heritage. So what uh, unique sort of ecology and heritage do we have here sort of native to New Brunswick, but also to the Fundy biosphere that might be pretty unique? Yeah, well, just uh, in terms of the time of year, what we're kind of looking forward to right now that we look forward every, to every year is the uh, the annual shorebird migration. Um, so in later in the summer and starting kind of in late July and through September, um, the, you know, the Bay of Fundy region plays a critical role for um for the staging area for shorebirds as they migrate um, from the, the Arctic uh, where they breed uh, down through the Bay of Fundy and then they make a nonstop flight. Uh, a lot of the really small uh, peeps as we call them, um, the really small shorebirds make a nonstop flight from the Bay of Fundy uh, down all the way to the Northern coast of South America. Uh, so that's about three to four days straight of flying. Um, and so they, they stop over in the Bay of Fundy on their way to eat as much as they can. Um, some folks who, who I work with describe uh, the Bay of Fundy as kind of a, a comfy all you can eat uh, buffet uh, and a hotel for, for yeah. these birds. So they, uh, they double their body weight in some cases, some of the species and then make that nonstop flight. So it's a really important area for them to, uh, you know, get that resource and then carry on on their journey. What are they primarily eating? So they eat it kind of a combination of things They eat um, a lot of um, you know, they, they really like the Bay of Fundy because of the at low tide, they feed on the mud flats. Um, so they pick out um, a number of invertebrates and also some uh, biofilm that's kind of on top of the mud flat there. Uh, so they do a lot of their feeding at low tide and then they come onto the beaches um, all along the Bay of Fundy um, during high tide to rest and to kind of digest all of that food that they're eating. Uh, and that's, you know, a really important time for uh, for them to be resting and to conserve the, all that energy they need to make that flight um, as they move through the region. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that they double their body weight. So does that mean by the time that they make it to their destination, they have like cut their body weight in half? Like have they used all that energy? Yeah, they they use almost all of it for sure. So it's a really, um, you know, again, it may, kind of reemphasizes the point that it's such an important place, the Bay of Fundy. Um, for these birds. So in some cases, yeah, they can go from about like 40 grams or so to about 80 grams, um, the birds themselves. And they look physically quite a bit different from when they first arrive to yeah. when, when they leave, when they're here for their three or four weeks um, feeding and, and resting. And, um, and yeah, they, they burn through that kind of big energy reserve to get themselves down there. Mm -hmm. Now, with that being such a big thing for the birds to be making that big stop before they go down south, is that something that is like protected or is that something that in the recent years, maybe you've seen that there's industry moving in that is there risk of us losing those shorebirds? So shorebirds are in decline. Um, so recent um, yeah, reports have definitely indicated that they're in decline. Um, and there's, you know, a whole bunch of factors and, and reasons why that is the case, obviously. Um, a lot of the shorebirds that we have moving in through here um, have experienced habitat loss as one of the, I would say, one of the main kind of driving threats to uh, the species. So things like, um, especially that, that kind of margin of habitat that they like to roost on. So things like uh, shoreline har har hardening and, and sea level rise and, and climate change is kind of starting to shift um, the, with the species as well. Um, and another kind of big one that we can, you know, each individuals can kind of take a, 
some responsibility for is just making sure that we're not disturbing the birds when they are roosting at high tide. Like I mentioned, they do a lot of feeding at low tide in the mud flat and they come and they rest kind of in big groups um, on the beaches during high tide. And so sometimes if we have our you know dogs off leash or if we're kind of running along the beach and we flush the birds, they're using a lot of their energy um, that they would otherwise need to you know conserve again to make that really long flight. Uh, so it's really important from that perspective to make sure that if we do see that clump of birds, uh, just being mindful of them, um, giving them a, you know, a big wide berth, um, and uh, yeah, especially around that high tide um, time of day. I know that's something that as a kid I loved to do was you see a big flock of birds <laughs> or even seagulls or anything. You're just like, yeah, I'm exactly. going to run through it because they're going to go crazy. But mm -hmm. I didn't know that, that that was their their time to rest, to be able to uh, to conserve their energy for that big flight. Yeah, exactly. And so it's it's important, you know, to get to get the word out there about it and to keep kind of that education and communication going, um, you know, over time, because we have, uh, you know, people coming from all over the place uh, who visit the Bay of Fundy. Obviously, it's a big tourism draw as well. So, um, you know, both locals and uh, and visitors alike, you know, we all have that kind of shared responsibility and kind of uh, so that's one of the you know big roles that we try to play and a lot of our partners try to play in terms of kind of continuing that education going. Uh, and also kind of celebrating the birds as they come through. So um, I live here in Sackville and not too far away in Dorchester and outside Dorchester is the Johnson Mills Shorebird um, Interpretive Center, which is run by the Nature Conservancy of Canada. And every year that community has a big sandpiper festival uh, where they celebrate the shorebirds on, when they come back. And, um, you know, it's a big, uh, big event with lots and lots of fun activities. And so there's lots of ways we can celebrate uh, this kind of really unique kind of interesting moment of nature that we find in, in the place that we live. So it's, it's really, really cool. That's awesome. I think that that's something that uh, we definitely should be, well, you just focus on it, right? Like it's something that we as New Brunswickers sort of take for granted that we have these beautiful places and we can go visit. And especially if you spend most of your time in the city and you're just like, yeah, it's kind of novel to go see some birds, but to know that they play such a, uh, such an important role in multiple uh, places, not just here, not just the Bay of Fundy, but also down South as well. So other mm -hmm. than shorebirds, you uh, mentioned, I guess, in your email about iNaturalist, you do a little bit of documenting uh, some biodiversity, but talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so we've done, um, you know, through Nature and Bee, as I mentioned, one of our big kind of pillars or programs, ongoing programs is citizen science. So we're really, um, you know, we really push everyday folks um, to become citizen scientists and contribute to, you know, the collection of biodiversity information kind of all across the province. Um, and one of the tools that we use is iNaturalist. And so iNaturalist is a citizen science um, application. Essentially, you can use it through the web on your computer, but you can also use it through your smartphone. Um, and essentially, it's a really powerful program where you can take a picture of anything in nature, uh, whether it be a plant or a bird or, um, you know, what have you. And it gets uploaded into this large database of um, observations, of nature observations. And there's actually kind of a community of naturalists from all across the world who help you know, hundreds and thousands of people who help identify photos that are being put onto this um, system. And so it's a really, really nice way to kind of learn about some of the species that are in your backyard or learn about some of the species in the places that you go and visit. Um, and it also contributes to kind of our understanding of, you know, where certain species are, um, you know, what's their distribution, what's their abundance. Um, and it kind of gets people connected with nature and, and especially um, in, in their own backyards and their own local areas. So over the last couple of years, um, we've started doing these kind of provincial wide or kind of regional focused bio blitzes. Um, and so we do those through iNatural. So we, you know, we encourage people to get out and to use it, um, to learn how to use it. And we've done a lot of kind of outreach and engagement with a lot of our nature clubs in terms of training our naturalists how to use the tool. Um, and it's just, it's a really fun way to, um, to learn about some of the species that are around and, uh, and to connect with nature for sure. So it's a, that's a fun one for sure. Now, is there any tracking data? Like, is it of larger animals and mammals too? Or is it mostly just plants and smaller insects and stuff? Yeah, so it's anything living. So it can be yeah, larger mammals uh, all the way down to your small uh, insects. Uh, and there's you know lots of experts that are uh, involved in iNaturalist as well. So there's there's kind of curators on the site that can help you identify, you know, more complicated things. Um, 
you know, but yeah, it can range anything from, you know, fungus to plants, to birds, to mammals, whatever. Mm -hmm. wow, that's super cool. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam, where can people find more about uh, Nature NB or even about uh, other organizations that you're working with? Actually, where can they get iNaturalist? I'm going to look it up on my phone right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on your phone, uh, whether you have an Android or, a, or an Apple, you can download it off of your app store just called iNaturalist. Mm -hmm. um, and you can make an account um, just as you would for any other application that you download. And then you can get started that way. Um, you can also make an account um, on your computer online uh, through the website iNaturalist.ca. Um, and again, make, make an account and, and go for it. Um, and you can you can pair those two things. So you don't need two separate accounts. You, mm -hmm. you can have one account for your on the web and, and on your phone. And uh, yeah, it's as easy as just bringing your phone along with you, snapping a picture and even uploading it while you're out um, or waiting until you get home on your Wi-Fi and, and uploading it. Um, and then, it, you know, you start to learn and also contribute to that kind of pool of knowledge um, as you go along. Um, and in terms of Nature NB, we also have um, a website, natureNB.ca. Um, and we have, we're on all of the social media channels as well, um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, just at NatureNB. Um, and so you can definitely keep up to date with uh, all of our different activities through those channels. And uh, we also have a, an e-newsletter you can sign up for if you visit our website. You can uh, enter your details in there and uh, keep up to date on what all of our staff are up to and the different events that we have going on uh, through the year. Awesome. So definitely check out Nature MB. And if you are, uh, actually, we'd probably love to have you back for the shorebird migration for the celebration in the fall. Um, so if you are curious about iNaturalist, and if you are listening and you want to check that out, please do. So you can join everybody across the world that is uh, that is contributing to this app and to this, uh, actually, scientific findings. That's huge. That's amazing. Definitely. Adam, thank, thank you so very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you for listening to the Fundy Bias for Your I Speak series, and we will see you next time. For more information about the Fundy Biosphere or to contact us, you can find us on social media or visit us at fundy-biosphere.ca.